Ooh, it's nine o'clock. I just realized. It. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a quick reminder, if you could, before we launch the, um, yeah. if you could mute on your Zoom. Yep. Here we go. And but then also, if you click mute on your Zoom, like you have to um, oh, yeah, in yeah. the bottom bar there. Well, good morning, everybody. It's nine o'clock, nine oh one. So why don't we take a seat and and get ready to start? Right. Next time I'll bring a wine glass. <laughs> Right. Or a bell, cowbell, or, you know, something. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm going to stop the room, David. We can't hear you, so I'm not sure if Open Signal has the room audio turned on. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Okay, very good. Um, all right, so let's begin at the top in terms of reminders. Uh, we are hosting this meeting in person and also on Zoom. Uh, this is a public meeting. Observers may watch uh, from this room also on Zoom or YouTube live stream. Uh, we are also recording this meeting for those who cannot attend right now and also for documentation purposes. Uh, we ask observers to listen quietly and please take a moment to turn your cell phones to silent. Also, um, again, we've gone over this before, but it's also, it's always worth repeating. Uh, we have agreed to uh, basic meeting ground rules. Again, silence electronics. 
be curious and willing to learn and contribute, ask questions of each other to gain clarity and understanding, express yourself in terms of your preferences, interests, and outcomes you wish to achieve, listen and speak respectfully, and try sincerely to understand the needs and interests of others, respectful communication is absolutely key. Seek common ground. Let's try to find solutions together. Honor each other by being honest, authentic, and brave. Make space, then take space. Be concise. Everyone on this committee should have the opportunity to be heard. Attend to impact. Good intentions can still cause harm. When someone is hurt, focus on listening and understanding the impact. The agenda is on your screen or should be on your screen. Uh, but before we get to the agenda, uh, one thing we heard at the last meeting is be before any of us speaks, we should identify ourselves, name and organization. There are a few people here today who are pinch hitting for their principles. So what I'd like to do very quickly, uh, if we can go around the room, since there are some new faces here, if you can please state your name and organization. And Gianna, we'll start with you. Good morning, Jana Jarvis, Oregon Trucking Association. Good morning, Sarah Ryan with Multnomah County for Commissioner Jayapal. Good morning, Frank Bubinick, Mayor C. H. Walton. Good morning, James Paulson. I'm here representing EMAC. Good morning, everybody. Roy Bialystowski, I'm the Mayor of Westland. Good morning, J.C. Veneta with TriMet. Paul Savas, Clackamas County Commissioner representing the Commission. Good morning, Carly Francis, Washington State Department of Transportation. Curtis Robinhold from the Port of Portland. Brendan Finn, good morning with ODOT. Good morning, Chris Strickler, ODOT. Lynn Peterson, representing the Metro Council. Good morning, everyone. Nafisa Fai, Washington County Commissioner, representing the board and also your representative for the STRAC Committee. At Casey Whiteola, Virginia Garcia Memorial Health Center. Willie Myers, Columbia Pacific Building Trades Council. Keith Lynch, Federal Highway Administration. Ann McInerney Ogle, Mayor for the City of Vancouver. Good morning, Adam Fiss, Southwest Washington Regional Transportation Council, filling in for Matt Ranson. Hi there, Shannon Carney. I am with the City of Portland, filling in for Commissioner Mingus Maps. Good morning, Sarah Ayanna on the Street Trust. Della Mosier, ODOT. Okay, very good. Thank you. That's that's really helpful. And uh, so now we all know who we, we are. Agenda is on the screen um, and the topics are also in front of you. Uh, I will say that the agenda has been prepared uh, in large part to reflect much of the feedback received during the uh, listening session in May. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to ODOT Director Chris Strickler for opening comments. All right. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for showing up uh, the day after Sine Die. Yay. Congratulations to the legislature. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for not just attending today, but for the conversation we had the last uh, time we all met together. Uh, we had the uh, agenda up. Uh, I will daylight that there's been uh, some request for additional conversation around other topics uh, in addition to what we have on the agenda. So we might modify a portion of the agenda. Uh, depending upon time, et cetera. But uh, I'll go through a little bit of what uh, requests have found their way to us and then uh, some of the things that we've already been working on in relation to that. Uh, so last meeting, we heard a number of things. We heard from everyone around the table, which was great. Uh, and while this is not a comprehensive list, and I want to be clear, I haven't captured everything here, but in my notes, I captured uh, a couple of things that we heard for sure. Equity must be centered in what we're doing uh, in the toll program. It has to be first, it has to be primary, and it has to lead uh, the things that we're doing as it relates to this program and starting it off right. And so today on the agenda, we have a portion of that uh, that we wanted to talk about. The next was putting the hard work on the table and focus on the tangible. Uh, this was tied to the issues and the policy and the mitigation requests uh, for off interstate projects. Uh, and I want to say part of what uh, brought us forward in asking for a project list was frankly conversation around this table and also with some of your senior staff saying we've done the work we've looked at the impacts we've looked at the analysis and we've we've identified some projects that we think are important to consider as part of this dialogue 
I'll also recognize though that some of those projects maybe aren't quite ready. We're in the midst of the RTP and some other things. And so while it was not intended to put anybody on the spot, it was actually intended to hear and bring forward, uh, I think what we we'd already, had already been hearing, which is we've done some of this work already, let's get it on the table. So candidly, and I, I, you know, I won't go around and call it individuals, but the goal was to say, let's get the projects on the table then. Let's talk about those things that we think are important that are associated with impacts and mitigation. Uh, and we'll come back to a little bit more of that later uh, when Brendan goes through a, a process piece uh, for us later in the agenda. The other thing I heard was listen and respond directly uh, and clarify the process that we have going forward. I think that's really important. Um, and it's one of the things that uh, I wanted to spend a few minutes on today. Uh, and then what toll revenues are going to be available? How are they gonna be used? What do we think the limit of those tolls are? Uh, and then where do we see that uh, as it relates to the overall finance plan? Uh, that request, or at least that uh, statement around this table, obviously reflects the current assignment that we've been working on at ODOT to address the questions related to the overall finance plan and the delivery uh, to the governor July 1st. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. So those are kind of the main themes. And again, I, did, I didn't capture everything, and I want to be clear. Uh, if you have another issue that uh, I didn't capture adequately or that's not captured here, I'm happy to hear it because I do want to make sure that we're reflecting that. Uh, but since the last meeting uh, and in response to the agenda that we posted, uh, we've received some comments. I want to thank Commissioner Maps uh, for uh, his comments uh, on RTAC. Uh, and I want to highlight a few of those and just put them out there so that everybody hears uh, what was in the letter to us. Uh, first was, uh, what is the timeline for RTAC? What is the timeline for this group? We had originally talked about this ending towards the end of this year because of the time constraint that we were under before. Uh, so extending the timeline to better correspond with the work that we have in front of us was uh, specific in his letter. The other was creating a connection between RTAC, OTC, uh, and the Legislative Planning Committee. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment as well. Um, sharing the toll projections in advance of submitting the finance plan to the governor. I will own that there's some tension and timing for that, but I do want to give you a few minutes of uh, what we anticipate uh, in the uh, financial plan going to the OTC uh, later this afternoon for them to deliberate on on Wednesday to, in order to hit the July 1st timeline, and I'll come back to that. Um, align the project list and mitigation with the public transportation strategy. I think we're trying to do that. You'll hear more about that uh, this afternoon, or excuse me, the, uh, later in the agenda. Uh, and then commit a portion of the toll revenue to address toll-related traffic, safety, climate, and equity impacts directly, uh, focusing on transit, bicycle, non-auto, uh, pedestrian improvements. Uh, and we'll talk just briefly about that as well. Uh, following on Commissioner Matt's request, we received also uh, a note and a request to have some of this dialogue from uh, good Mayor Bubenik uh, to reconfigure a bit of today's agenda. Uh, and while it's not formatted structurally on the agenda to do so, we will have a portion of that both in my remarks and then uh, in what Brendan's going to bring forward. Uh, in addition, uh, the mayor uh, put forward a decision to toll and congestion price uh, as part of ODOT's decision making and who was involved, how was how was that involved? Was it administrative in nature? Uh, I think we'll we'll come back and have more conversation around that because uh, I don't think it was administrative, but I do want to make sure that uh, we hear everybody's viewpoint about tolling all lanes, single lanes, uh, and the questions around that. Uh, and by the way, I'm only a third of the way through my monologue, so my apologies. Uh, while we were happy to configure a portion of the agenda, because again, today um, and this meeting is about hearing from you uh, and making sure that we capture that and that we inform the best outcomes going forward in the toll program, uh, I didn't feel comfortable tabling the equity item, and I want to be clear about that. Uh, I own that decision. Uh, I thought it was important for us to have that dialogue here because it was so prominent in the last discussion. So we'll have a portion of that, and then we'll dive into some of the other uh, elements as well. Uh, that said, uh, it's clear that we need to adjust somewhat, uh, and I want to address a few questions posed directly. And as I'm addressing those questions, I do want to just acknowledge the, the obvious thing in the room. There is a tension here in the needs we have in the region versus the available revenues associated with tolling or, frankly, with any other funding source. Uh, and it's timely uh, that uh, Signy Die was yesterday around four in the afternoon, 4.30 in the afternoon. Uh, and here we are already thinking about what it means to have a conversation about a, a package uh, for 25, what are the needs in the region and frankly across the state. 
And we need to be thinking of those things comprehensively. And as a region, my hope is that we can have that conversation here as well. Uh, so specifically to the to the questions, uh, the timeline for our tech, I want to be clear, I, I, I felt like I mentioned it in the last meeting, but I want to be super clear in this one, we plan to extend the timeline for our tech, I don't have a fixed date in mind. But candidly, if we're not collecting tolls until January 26, we know it's out well further than this year. So my commitment to you is that we have a conversation around a logical milestone around the table to say we're going to extend uh, this group as long as you're willing to continue showing up and having the conversation. Uh, the connection between the OTC and the planning committee. Um, first, let me talk about the OTC. Uh, as a reminder, this committee was established to advise me to take uh, the recommendations to the OTC. Uh, I still plan to do that. And at any time, any of you can feel free to comment directly to the OTC and have those conversations. Uh, as they are the toll authority for the state, I'm sure they'd be happy to hear uh, if we decide as a group uh, to designate uh, a couple of people. I think this committee showing up in force to have a conversation with the OTC sounds unwieldy, but if we can have a conversation around this table and say a couple of folks around this table feel like they want to represent the views of the whole table and show up and have a conversation with the OTC, I am happy to set that up, and I'm sure the commission is happy to hear that, but I do think we need to select those members wisely to make sure that we're rounding out all the opinions around the table. Uh, as it relates to the, um, oh, excuse me, um, and much like EMAC, uh, because we've done that with uh, EMAC, uh, I think that can be a very valuable conversation. Uh, and so again, I don't know the timing, I don't have the timing off the top of my head, uh, but I do think, um, and I wanted to address that directly to say, more than willing to do that, that's uh, the intent was never to provide uh, a barrier between this committee and the commission conversation. Um, the planning committee, uh, this is a function of the legislature. That's not me passing the buck. It's me um, owning for you that I don't have a decision in that. Uh, and so uh, happy to show up uh, and take part in the conversation for the planning committee. Uh, I'm sure the planning committee would love to hear from members around the table. I'm sure many of you have already had conversation uh, with those on the planning committee. I just wanna be clear, it's not something that I set the agenda for or something that ODOT sets. Um, sharing the toll projections for RTAC prior to submitting the finance plan to the governor. Uh, for clarity, the governor requested us to have our finance plan by July 1st. As you know, that's the end of this week. Uh, so our team's been working really hard to reflect the finance plan, uh, reflect the urban mobility strategy overall in that finance plan. Uh, and uh, we intend to send that to her office the end of this week. Uh, I want to daylight a few things that uh, you can expect to see this afternoon as we post materials for the OTC. And again, uh, I, you know, I beg your indulgence on the timeline. The team's been working really hard to try and pull together the information. Uh, and what we have is a convergence, frankly, of uh, delaying toll collection until January 26th at the earliest. That does have a financial impact. Uh, cost increases associated with the projects as they sit. That's obviously going to provide tension on the revenues uh, when the costs go up. Uh, we've had scope changes on many of the projects in the urban mobility strategy, and those changes are for the good. Uh, they are to improve the transportation connection and access in this region, but those changes do come at a cost, and I want to be clear about that, and I think that's um, at the basis of what the governor is asking. Uh, and then in addition to that, um, we have probably, uh, I don't want to say less reliability on tolling, but we have to be more conservative in what we are planning for tolling because as timing shifts and as our ability to bring some of those toll dollars in to pay for some of these projects, it impacts our short-term borrowing capacity. And I don't want to get too technical, uh, but when we short-term borrow in anticipation of tolls and then that gets delayed, your capacity on your short-term notes uh, are, are impacted. Uh, and so the available revenues for the projects uh, are reduced. So uh, to deliver the plan to uh, the governor, uh, the OTC will be considering options Wednesday morning, 9 a.m. Uh, we'll be posting the information later today. It's a short finance plan that goes through the high level uh, of each of the urban mobility strategy projects. It captures all of those things I just described, which cost uh, impacts associated, et cetera. Uh, and the team's been really active uh, in trying to get that done by the timeline. Uh, as we look at the impacts, uh, what I can share with you in advance is this. Uh, the total cost of your mobility strategy, which includes Rose Quarter, I-205 improvements, the region-wide pricing program, Boone Bridge, uh, and back office toll implementation, not to mention other impacts and mitigations associated with each of these projects, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 3.7 to 4.3 billion dollars. That's the overall 
uh, costs as we know it today. But now I will tell you those are subject to change, increase, et cetera, based upon delay uh, and um, additional, frankly, scope adjustments as we move those projects forward. Uh, the funding sources that have been allocated to the urban mobility strategy come from some amounts of federal and state resources that were invested in the early planning phase and the early design phase and some of those uh, funds that have contributed to the early work for each of those projects. Uh, it also includes the $30 million that was allocated in House Bill 2017. That's a bondable amount. And we're isolating that amount uh, because what we've heard regionally as well as across the state is don't impact the STIP and pull out of other projects that are necessary across the state in order to fund these projects in the region. So we've tried to isolate the finance plan over the last several years to that $30 million uh, based on response to House Bill 3055. Uh, for those of you that um, aren't tracking as close as we have to, House Bill 2017 and 2017 dedicated $30 million in revenue to the Rose Quarter Project, and then House Bill 3055 in the 21 session uh, reallocated that and said, uh, from a cash basis, that $30 million goes towards your mobility strategy, not just the Rose Quarter Project, but balance it based upon cash flow needs. Still recognizing the importance of each of those projects, and that's the part that I want to be clear about. Uh, so no other known sources of funding uh, are, are uh, planned or that we're bringing forward at this point, at least sources of funding that we can count on for uh, the urban mobility strategy. So once again, it is the initial infusion of some of the local, federal, uh, and state dollars that were earlier on in the projects. Uh, it is House Bill 2017 dollars and that $30 million bondable amount. Uh, and then finally, uh, tolling was to play a significant portion. Um, the funding as we added up. Uh, as we look at um, uh, before announcing the delay in collection, that amounted, amounted to about $1.4 billion in project funds that we could count on. Uh, as we consider the delay in collection, we currently have $1.1 billion in dedicated funding. So put simply, $3.7 to $4.3 billion in overall need, $1.1 billion in available dedicated funding. That's where we sit today. And that's what you'll see uh, in the finance plan that posts this afternoon. Uh, specific to tolling, I know the questions come around this table. Uh, my understanding has been that it's been fairly well known. And if it's not, my apologies, uh, let's make it known now. And that is uh, our level two analysis for the I-205 project projected roughly $385 million if you toll the Abernathy Bridge. So available project funds to the Abernathy Bridge, about $385 million. If we toll uh, on the Twalton River Bridges as well on I-205, it brings an additional $300 million. That is the toll revenue projection associated uh, with uh, the projects that we're working on. So the finance plan incorporates that $385 million uh, that is anticipated for Abernathy. Uh, given the delay, the increase in scope, uh, Obviously, we have uh, a problem if we have 1.1 billion in available funding uh, and over $3 billion in project. And so there's a recognition that we have to put a finance plan together that says this is what we can do near term. And then longer term, we have to talk about funding. We have to talk about where the other funding would come, not just for these projects, but for the regional needs that we have across the region uh, and across the state. Um, hence, you hear me talk frequently about uh, more than one funding source. I'm not just talking about tolling. I'm talking about uh, a conversation with our legislative friends in 25, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then finally, um, I want to say that uh, the commission does want to hear from you. Uh, I'd encourage you to digest the plan. Uh, it's, a, it's a simple, uh, straightforward, um, short document. It's not hundreds of pages. Uh, it is something that the team finished up Friday and over the weekend uh, in order to get ready to post, uh, and the commission will consider it. And there's options within it, uh, frankly, that are tough options. Uh, but as you look to uh, the commission making a recommendation, they plan to make one on Wednesday based upon the information given uh, at their special meeting and then advance that report to the governor uh, in time for the July 1st time frame. Uh, so I'd offer that uh, any of you that are interested in making comment, please uh, sign up to do so. Uh, the commission would be happy to hear from you. Uh, finally, uh, and I think this is the second time I've said finally, but I really am almost done. Uh, we know that many of you want to see different tolling scenarios. Uh, I want to say we plan to run 
different tolling scenarios. Uh, we recognize that the single scenario, or at least the single scenario with some variation, uh, has created, I think, a, a, almost a polarizing conversation. Uh, one around, geez, I can't believe we're paying that much to uh, does it produce enough revenue, right? I mean, it's all over the place as it relates to the comments associated with that. Uh, there's an ongoing tension between keeping the toll rates low enough uh, to limit the burden on the users, especially those that we've historically marginalized with transportation decisions for years, and having it create the congestion management benefit uh, that we're search searching for in this uh, program and the revenues associated with the project. Uh, so in addition uh, to all of that, um, we've also focused the program on that managing congestion and redu reducing greenhouse gases. So those tensions, I think, uh, are going to continue to be part of our conversation around this table. Uh, but I've heard loud and clear from several of you uh, that we need to see other scenarios so we can really balance those tensions in the conversation. So with that, uh, I'd like to ask our, our senior leadership teams uh, to get together uh, to really focus on what those scenarios could be. And I'm sure that there's probably comments and suggestions around the table uh, for scenarios as well. Uh, that said, there is a limit to the number of scenarios you can run. Uh, we don't want to run so many scenarios that we can't ever get to a conversation around what the impacts are, uh, but recognizing that that's far different from a single scenario. So with that, uh, any questions? I know I ran through a lot there. Two things, I had a question. Yeah. You said planning committee. What did you mean by planning? Sorry, the legislative planning committee. Is that the subcommittee? The, the new subcommittee, or subcommittee? Subcommittee, okay. the joint committee. And secondly, the 385 mm -hmm. million uh, generated for 205, is that annually or is that over a time period? That is the amount available for project proceeds uh, to go to Abernathy Bridge based upon tolling at Abernathy. And that's in the uh, level two analysis. I don't have the date that that was completed, uh, but it's, I think we've got it out there. If not, we can get it to the group. Okay, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Just had a quick question. Um, oh, sorry. oh, go ahead. Sorry. So would you um, explain the 385 million again? I missed that, sure. Chris. Yeah. Are we talking over the lifetime of the project or are we... What time frame is that 385 million? Yeah, fair enough. So it is the available project proceeds. Uh, and we've got Travis in the back to help explain in more detail. But basically what it is, is uh, annual toll revenues then brought forward and bonded against to get to $385 million in available proceeds for the project. So that is the cash value for a project based upon a 30 plus year timeline of toll revenue collection. And that's for tolling at Abernathy. Mr. Mayor. Let's go with uh, President Peterson and then Mayor Rory. Oh, I don't want to skip over this financial discussion because my comments are related to the um, scenario. So just come back to me. Thank you. I was just going to ask, I, I'm, how, how did you get to the $385 million? Like, Are there toll rate assumptions in there? Because I've always heard that we don't know the rates yet, but what are, what are the rate assumptions that we're using to get to that point? Yeah, the rate assumption has been the base rate uh, that has been out for uh, the, EA, uh, the EA work. Uh, and so that has been the rate assumption built in that financial capacity. But to be clear, rate has not been set yet. Uh, and the commission obviously won't be setting that rate for several months, if not a year and a half. One last clarifying question. Sure. Um, the I-205 pro project, which you related the 385 million, the, that's the toll project or that's the construction project? Is it phase 1A or is it all of it? Which define the project? Yeah, so uh, actually I'm defining the toll points. Um, and so let me, let me refine that just a little bit. Uh, if we toll at Abernathy and in the Abernathy location of the bridge, uh, that's about $385 million in available project proceeds going to Abernathy. If we toll, in addition to Abernathy, at Tualatin River Bridges, uh, and you recall those are the ones closer to Stafford, uh, then it would be roughly an additional $300 million. Uh, I will say, as you look at the overall funding capacity, and as you look at the available funding and the other sources of funding associated with that, uh, what you'll see in the finance plan this afternoon is likely the lanes portion is uh, delayed because of funding. And so we have the Abernathy contribution and the Abernathy portion available uh, for the upfront finance plan work, uh, but the, the lanes would be delayed until the finance plan can be pulled together. 
Land on the bridge, Anla? Nope, lanes on the bridge are there for Abernathy, uh, but the, the lanes portion that extends further to the, I guess it's the west or south, depending upon where you are on the corridor, to Stafford. President Peterson. All right, um, thank you. And Chris, thank you for going through all of that information. It was really helpful. Um, on the scenarios, I think you're right about the tension um, around having one option. And I, I think in, in my brain, there is now a question about, since we have a delay with tolling, but we're moving towards the, the RMPP, at what point do we not need an actual toll, but instead we rely on the congestion pricing in the corridor? So when we look at the series of conversations that are going on around questions, the scenarios are pretty simple to me, and I think they're five. And that sounds like a lot, but it actually isn't. There's a conversation about the continuation of a toll and RMPP. There's the RMPP with all three lanes, no toll. The RMPP with two lanes, no toll and RMPP with one lane, no toll. There might, there might be some hybridization of that, but let me just go back to the regional transportation plan had the goal of a perfect system in, in RMPP. And I think that's where everybody started, including JPACT, right? This region has said, here's what the, the ultimate perfect solution could look like. And I think that's where that one scenario may have come from in coordination with the state and the legislature and right but the question is what what happens in this part of the system that's so important to keep in mind is that there are no there we have not been able to get to all of the best practices to make the the toll and rmpp work we have not we have not mitigated we right we there are a lot of barriers to making this the perfect in terms of GHG, gas emissions, in terms of demand management, in terms of everything that's happening in that part of the corridor. So looking at these different scenarios, I think will help us determine what are the benefits, what's the revenue, and what, what impacts there actually are. Because right now we're actually having to mitigate for a lot and we don't know if some of that mitigation would necessarily be required if other projects were added to the list, as well as um, the, the, the availability of different lane types um, on the freeway. So that, to me, those are the five that, that I have heard need to be discussed, obviously open to others, but I think Metro Council, as I have talked to Metro Councilors, are open to uh, considering other options to make sure that we are moving the project forward as well as moving the region forward. Jenna. Thank you. Um, as part of the GHG reductions, Chris, um, is there a consideration only for the volume of traffic or is there a consideration for the flow of traffic in that calculation? Uh, it's really uh, a function of the management of congestion, and so it, it actually takes both into consideration. So the better the flow, the lower the GHG, and that's part of the objective, correct? I, I guess I would answer that by saying partially yes, uh, but if uh, it flows better, but you're serving an exorbitant amount number, uh, uh, an increase in vehicular traffic, then you're actually not benefiting GHG. So you've got to balance both of those. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have time for one more comment or question. Commissioner Savas. Yeah, I just want to, I appreciate, I was trying to write all that down, um, President Peterson. Uh, so I appreciate your um, your suggestions. And the one I think that came up last uh, meeting, uh, I believe it was Commissioner Fi raised the issue about express lanes. But whether it's express lanes or two lanes of RMPP or any of those scenarios, geographically, we're looking at a, we're only looking at two interstates, right? Uh, we're leaving out, I think, 
217, Highway 26, I-84, all of those. So I think that would change the revenue, right? Substantially, if those were included. So I think geographically, we ought to be looking at, you know, a system, express lane system. Um, it works in other other parts of this country and it generates revenue, but uh, I, I think that might add to the funding conversation. Okay, we are off to a great start. Uh, thank you, Director, for the overview. Thanks to all of you for comments and questions. Um, yes, Director. So I, I uh, want to make sure that I'm capturing this. Uh, tolling uh, and RMPP combined. RMPP, all lanes, no toll. Uh, and by no toll, you mean I-205. Uh, RMPP, two lanes, no toll on I-205. And RMPP, one lane, no toll. I, I think um, what I'd like to do is have our senior staff get together or the agencies around the table to really talk about and look into what each of these might be and the only the only caveat that i see is as we look at the potential scenarios uh if we end up in a position where the recommendation is that we can not advance the lanes at this time uh that go beyond the abernathy bridge out to stafford then that might impact what we analyze uh here i think one of the things that is at least creating clarity for me. And I'm not sure if I'm just slow uh, on this and if you've all been there for a while, but it is frankly the, the difference between us talking about what we want in the future and thinking of that future date versus the time that it takes to get there. And on the path to getting there uh, is not a light switch. It's not um, everything is status quo until the day that it's not. And then all of a sudden we turn it on and then we've got this future state. There is a sequence uh, that we would have to employ, um, and we have been trying to figure out the best sequence, and we need your help in doing so. And I think that sequence might be embodied in some of these scenarios. Uh, and I just want to be completely clear um, that as projects come online, there might be an impact associated with that project if other things aren't online at the same time. Uh, and I, the first thing that comes to mind is the lanes portion for 205. We're obviously under construction for Abernathy. We are not under construction for the lanes. Uh, and the finance plan this afternoon will show that we don't have the funding to start that right now. All right. As I mentioned, we are off to a good start uh, with this conversation. And uh, the remaining portion of this meeting will be focused on two pretty substantial topics, equity and nexus projects. And um, we will spend the next 45 minutes uh, going through a, a fairly deep dive on the equity framework. Uh, how do we center equity in all of, all of this effort? Uh, and then we will uh, switch to a, an initial discussion on nexus projects. It's not the... It's not the first, it's not the last conversation, it's the first conversation of many on Nexus projects. So with that, let me turn it over to Mandy Putney and uh, she will walk us through uh, various equity aspects. Good morning. Nice to see everybody. I'm Mandy Putney with ODOT's Urban Mobility Office, and I'm going to do my best to share some details about how the project team has worked to incorporate equity um, as we move forward with the toll program development and also the toll project development. Um, I'll remind you that James Paulson did an excellent presentation um, recently on the work of the Equity and Mobility Advisory Committee, or EMAC. Um, he's still here. Feel free to chime in, James. And he's also available to answer questions as they come along. And I'll also note that Hannah Williams is in the back, and she has been um, a lead proponent at ODOT for community um, CBO engagement um, and community engagement um, with our community engagement liaisons. And she's available to go into more detail or answer questions as we go along as well. Um, and I obviously can't cover everything. Um, and so happy to follow up with you afterwards with more information if you need it, um, or you want to sit down and go into more detail about any of the things that I bring up today. Um, we have a lot more work to do, and the feedback that has come from you all as well as your staff has definitely helped us get to where we are today. We can go to the next slide. Um, we did the value pricing feasibility analysis and completed that, um, and by 2019, we clearly knew that to move forward with the development of a toll program, our success would be dependent on attending to issues of systemic inequity. 
um, thinking about community safety and diversion and the lack of um, travel options or mobility, um, especially for um, BIPOC and low-income communities throughout the region. There was an intentional effort by ODOT to build a team that came with expertise, both professional and lived, uh, to support us in our work as we move forward. We brought in the nonprofit Transform, who had done some groundbreaking work on um, equity and pricing um, to help us with our team, um, as well as other local equity consultants, um, and got to work um, moving forward with starting up the EMAC um, also around the same time. This allowed us to have a draft of the equity framework by early 2020. You heard quite a bit about that from James um, recently. Um, that was adopted in um, by the end of 2020. Uh, I'll just clarify that when we're talking about equity, um, both at the project level as well as with EMAC, that we talk about process equity and outcome equity. Process equity measures and helps us determine how successful the projects are achieving inclusive and accountable participation of historically and currently excluded and underserved communities in the transportation planning and decision-making processes. And outcome equity measures address uh, three dimensions, affordability or user costs, access to opportunity and community health to determine uh, which pricing and equity strategies best advance, advance equity. So I'll start a little bit talking about outcome equity and how we built this into some of our project analysis and then talk about process equity. We can go on to the next slide. Um, and uh, this is where I could dip really far in the weeds and I'm gonna try not to, but if you're really interested in the details, uh, we have lots of uh, technical staff that we can uh, connect you with afterwards. Uh, so for our analysis um, for 205, we wanted to determine whether equity framework communities would experience a change in accessibility or a change in travel time to important um, social and community uh, resources. Um, so this goal helped us shape our accessibility analysis, our travel time analysis, um, and there's some more information here on the screen as well as a map. Um, and when we're talking about equity framework communities for our analysis, we're thinking about people experiencing low income or at economic disadvantage, um, race and um, ethnicity, people experiencing a disability, um, seniors over the age of 65, children um, up to age 18, people with limited English proficiency and households that don't have access to a vehicle. Um, our analysis uh, allowed us to determine how many jobs, community places, and medical facilities could be reached within a 20 or 30 minute drive or a 30 or 45 minute transit trip. Um, and we looked at existing conditions, future conditions in 2045, alternatives with and without tolling. Um, and then we're able to think about travel time analysis potential travel time impacts or benefits um, to the equity framework communities I just mentioned. Um, and we use representative scenarios to do this work. So obviously we can't do every single route that someone might take, um, but we did see guidance from EMAC and our consultants on how to think through representative scenarios um, that would provide a variety of potential trip options. Um, to different community places, such as libraries, um, colleges, medical facilities, clinics, grocery stores, um, and, and um, options like that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we used uh, transportation analysis zones and relied heavily as we have been on uh, Metro's work and planning, as well as their modeling capabilities as we're moving forward with our analysis. We defined where a high concentration of equity framework communities lived. Those were the home um, TAZs. And this was based on demographic data from the census. Um, and if a TAZ had a higher proportion of one or more equity framework communities than the county it was located in, we considered it an equity framework home TAZ. For example, TAZ 847 in Canby has a higher percentage of people with a disability and people who identified as an ethnic minority than Clackamas County as a whole. So it was labeled as an equity framework home TAZ. We also looked at activity TAZs where there was a high concentration of destinations that people would travel to. These were things like schools, parks, medical facilities. 
So TAZ 729 in downtown Oregon City um, has a core number of amenities such as grocery stores, job centers, religious organizations, a state unemployment office, a library, a public health building. Um, so this was also labeled as a equity TAZ. Next slide, please. The accessibility analysis helped determine the percent difference in the number of community places, jobs, medical facilities, and access that were accessible for households. Um, the alternative we found with tolling would result in the same or greater accessibility to social resources for households in the area of interest when compared to the alternative of not tolling. Um, and so our team did not see any decrease of accessibility for our representative scenarios based on this methodology. Um, the equity framework communities would generally experience the same or greater accessibility than the general population. Um, and so uh, we could see this when we were looking at specific drives, both to um, different jobs as well as other um, community locations in the area. Next slide, please. Um, so there were a total of 16 representative scenarios that estimated potential travel time impacts to equity framework communities and the general population. Uh, 12 of the scenarios were representative of the equity framework communities and had a starting point in one of the home TAZs. Four of the representative scenarios were representative of non-equity framework communities, and their starting point um, was in a TAZ that was not labeled as an equity TAZ. Um, one example here is shown on the screen. Um, it tells you, shows you where the trip would start, and the description of the trip, um, and then the endpoint. Uh, these scenarios, um, again, try to represent the best uh, portion and variety of options that might be undertaken. Um, and we looked at the route that would go through uh, 205, uh, the toll path, uh, as well as a segment that would be untold um, and labeled here as toll free path. This was to evaluate how travel times would be impacted on parallel routes that would be um, potentially subject to rerouting or diversion. In addition, there were three scenarios that were evaluated for transit travel times based on existing routes for transit trips. Um, and we assume that the transit trips would use the same route in the future. So we kind of had to use a little bit of what, what is known um, information right now. None of the representative scenarios would result in longer travel times for routes using the toll path under the alternative with tolling as compared uh, with the alternative without tolling. Um, three of the scenarios resulted in longer travel times on the untold path, which could indicate rerouting um, as a potential um, happening, um, and the team uh, evaluated the rerouting in more detail, though, and then proposed mitigation measures where there were impacts. Um, so overall, our analysis did show that trips using the 205 corridor had shorter travel times when compared to the alternative without tolling. Um, again, it was EMAC had helped us quite a bit through this process in terms of the representative scenarios, um, as well as the overall methodology. Next slide, please. Um, as we move forward with the regional mobility pricing project, uh, we plan to use uh, very similar uh, methodologies as we use for our equity methods for the 205 analysis. Although I do want to note that we are looking at a larger scale and scope of analysis and study, we're still working through how that scale and scope of study might inf influence um, and affect the analysis that is completed. Um, we do indicate, note that as we move forward, we'll do our methodologies first before we do the analysis. I mean, both the environmental justice and the community and social resource reports will first identify um, these sorts of uh, TAZs and then think through benefits and impacts um, as needed to respective communities. Next slide, please. Um, I'm now going to use the low income toll um, program development as kind of my branch be or the between the bridge between um, the outcome equity and the process equity. The low income toll program um, shows how we are working to ensure outcome equity as we're moving forward with pricing 
Uh, we are and have been intentional to develop the program also through a process that's strongly informed by equity communities. Uh, we've used a multi-step process so far in terms of sensitivity analysis, regional income analysis, um, meeting with the Equity and Mobility Advisory Committee for guidance and input, um, including recommendations, um, and then stakeholder interviews with low-income service providers, discussion groups with historically excluded and underserved groups, an online survey with um, 12,000 responses. Um, of those we heard from during those responses, um, almost 900 self-identified um, as having a household income of less than 50,000, um, 1,700 identified as BIPOC, and about 1,500 identified as living with a disability. Next slide, please. Um, we heard quite a bit from that early engagement um, before we finished the toll report, the low income toll report that was submitted to the legislature um, in the fall of last year um, and encouragement to look beyond the standard uh, federal definition of low income. Um, so for example, consider perhaps, you know, 200% of the federal poverty level um, have preference for, um, there, there was a preference that we were hearing about thinking about discounts or credits uh, that would be ongoing. So it wouldn't be just a one-time thing to think about um, enrollment and payment um, and how to provide uh, multiple options for payment. Um, and uh, next slide, we do here show um, how some of those are coming together. So the, the team and the state are planning that the low income program would be available on the first day of tolling, that there'll be um, multiple payment options accepted. Uh, lots of work has been underway with the STRAC to think about rulemaking as it relates to um, compliance um, and enforcement. Um, and thinking about how to continue to increase our partnerships with community-based organizations to continue to reduce access to barriers. Um, next slide, please. Some of the specific barriers that we've, uh, we've heard about and experienced are listed on this slide, on the left side, including limited English proficiency, um, limited or no internet access, um, inability um, or unwillingness to attend public meetings um, as they've traditionally been offered, a lack of trust in government, um, how different abilities uh, influence the ability to engage, um, and thinking through um, providing advice uh, and expertise uh, and not getting compensated for that. Um, we've used multiple tools to address these barriers to participation and be inclusive, including translation and interpretation, uh, collaborating with community partners or community engagement liaisons to help us determine um, what information to deliver and how to present it and to do that um, in a way that's uh, in language and also culturally relevant, holding discussion groups um, with community-based organizations and trusted partners. Um, we have worked specifically with community engagement liaisons that interact with um, Spanish speaking communities, Russian, Slavic, Vietnamese, Chinese, Native American communities, as well as people with, living with disabilities. Um, we had, have had four rounds of discussion groups since 2018. Um, next slide, please. Um, I am happy to share those, for some of you might know this, but ODOT has now the ability to compensate uh, for um, time and input and expertise. Um, this is a policy that was adopted in 2021. Uh, we're now able to compensate advisory committee members um, that aren't otherwise compensated through an employer. We're able to now engage in contracts directly with community-based organizations so they can sponsor and host engagement activities as well as provide um, input and guidance on how to best uh, do our engagement. Um, we've been able to provide incentives for discussion group participants or focus group participants um, 
And we've used this for, uh, as we've developed the low income toll program, the earlier work for the regional mobility pricing project, and also as the I-205 toll project has been developed. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we have uh, learned quite a bit uh, over the last three years as we've been doing this work um, and uh, thinking specifically about the equity framework communities that I mentioned before. Uh, we have heard that uh, equity framework communities rely heavily on the interstate system. People who identify as Black, Native American, or Slavic use I-5 and I-205 more regularly than the overall population. Um, the concerns of the equity framework communities are not significantly different from the overall general population. Um, they have remained consistent over time as we've been doing this work over the last three years. Primary concerns relate to why toll revenue is needed, what diversion might be, what the effects will be for household finances, and overall, is it a fair proposal? Uh, there is negative sentiment, especially from a larger percentage of people in the Black, Native American, and Slavic communities that have come in uh, as we've been talking about our efforts. Um, and we have seen that equity framework communities are more likely to prioritize minimizing the impact of tolls to people with low incomes um, and also to um, think about providing alternative um, non-toll driving routes. Um, and that comes in stronger than other survey respondents. Diversion and reducing congestion is also a concern, um, but less so. Last spring, we did hear um, uh, input from folks to keep tolls as low as possible, um, and that there wasn't a desire to raise tolls for the, the nice to have things or the extra things. Um, transit is often not currently viewed as a viable alternative to driving, but if there were improvements, then um, that would that would shift. Um, and we hear consistent skepti skepticism that tolling could reduce congestion. I think we hear this as we're talking to um, the non-equity framework communities as well, um, and that there is a desire for reliable travel. Um, along with using toll revenue for transportation improvements. There is a concern that voices won't matter in decision-making um, and a desire to understand how input will be reflected as we move forward. Um, next slide, please. This one is a reminder of the recommended actions that EMAC has provided to the Oregon Transportation Commission. Um, James went through these in quite a bit of detail, so I, I'm not going to go through them here, but just as a reminder, these um, recommendations were well received by the commission um, and are being used as we move forward with both the toll program and the toll project development. Um, next slide, please. We've been working quite a bit with EMAC um, at a subcommittee level to plan an accountability workshop um, for July. Um, and part of that work has been to go through the recommended actions and be able to identify our progress on each of them, um, identify what we have achieved and what our next steps are as we move forward. Um, and we've had quite a bit of conversation about kind of opportunities um, and challenges as we think about further collaboration uh, moving forward. Um, so these are the challenges that have been identified at this point, and I think we'll talk about them more um, at the accountability workshop, um, but thinking through uh, just the framework that we have to work through in terms of um, the allowable use of highway funding. Um, as there were conversations this morning, thinking about uh, competing priorities, congestion management, development of a low income program, availability of revenue, um, and how do we move forward knowing that there's a desire to have kind of pieces of all of these things. Uh, we are really excited, as I mentioned, to have the ability to contract with CBOs and uh, it has a bit of complexity to the process. Um, and we are hearing that there's a desire to continue to expand that. So we're, we're always working with our procurement office and the Office of um, Social Equity to think about how we can have a process as we move forward that's expandable and also um, not perhaps quite as administratively challenging. Um, and then 
as this group is also interested in thinking about uh, long-term um, monitoring and reporting, so is EMAC. Um, and this will also be a key topic of conversation at the accountability workshop is thinking about uh, what are the items related to equity that we should be accountable for and how do we do that reporting and um, more than just a sharing of a report, but how do we really have um, ongoing equitable engagement in that content um, after we set up the toll program. Um, that's my last slide. So I will turn it back to uh, David for discussion facilitation. Thank you, Mandy, for the deep dive. Here's what I'd like to suggest we do. Um, you heard a lot. And so uh, let's spend some time taking your questions uh, from Mandy, Hannah, and James. And then after that, we will enter into a period of, of conversation, discussion. I'll start with some leading questions. Uh, Brendan. Uh, yeah, thanks, David. Um, before we begin, I think as Director Strickler and I have refl reflected back on our, our last meeting, which um, we really appreciate, was that we got to hear from everybody. Uh, and that's really important to us as part of this process. We know you all are, are putting the time in here. So uh, while we're having this discussion, we've been brainstorming on ways where we can continue to have everyone's engagement, um, knowing that we don't have, uh, obviously, the time to do it. So I'm going to be passing out some worksheets for some of the feedback um, that are going to be on these next two items, uh, one of the Nexus projects, and, and if we're hitting the mark here on equity correctly. Fill them out here if ideas are coming to your head. If not, we're going to distribute a Google Doc uh, to you all later uh, for you to do that uh, offline as well. So, or actually online, but offline of this meeting. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. What's really important for us is for us to hear all of you and show that we're responding. So I'm gonna pass yeah, it Yeah, and, and that worksheet is, worksheet is really important because it's, it's a chance for you to weigh in with comments written if you cannot offer them here verbally in person or online. Uh, or if other thoughts come to you later. So multiple chances and opportunities to, to weigh in with comments and questions. And so with that, as mentioned previously, let's start with some questions and then we'll go into a, uh, a conversation and we'll start with Commissioner Savas. Yeah, I'm not sure mine is necessarily a question that is an observation, a concern, and that is that in our 43 page response to the EA from Clackamas County, 38 pages of which is technical, um, it became evident to us that the, um, the a lot of the conclusions were, you know, there were errors. I think there are also flaws, but some of those conclusions were really focused on on facility, meaning the 205 itself versus off facility. And it also became clear to me that um, if there are the, the errors and flaws that we identified, I guess we had a we we brought on a firm with some expertise in this area. My concern is that the impacts to the um, that to the lower income marginalized communities of which EMAC has been focused on may be even greater than actually estimated, and uh, more so uh, perhaps in where they live, where they walk, where they bike, or you know uh, the transit in in the towns that they live in in these areas. So if that wasn't properly evaluated, um, I'm just I just want to just lay that concern out that that the off facility impacts are gr much greater than the EA. So I'm I'm hoping that there's a an adjustment in the EA that recognize does a deeper analysis because we found some concerns about that. I I I was listening very intently, Mandy. So it looks as though this is still based on the information in the EA. Uh, there's no new information. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for from? Oh, yes, President Peterson. Mandy, thank you. I know that there's been a lot of work put into this and a lot of um, new new work that uh, you have brought into ODOT based on Rose Quarter and this. So I just want to say thank you up front. Um, as, as we start thinking about this and the analysis that was done, um, and to Commissioner Savas's point, I, as we went through the conversation here, um, it just solidified in my mind that I mean, there's different there's different um, places that we need to put the equity lens on this project, and the toll is one of them. 
And I think what commissioners have is you're trying to get at is that the system isn't working as it as it stands today for uh, accessibility to opportunity um, within that part of the region. Again, because there's basically one way across the Willamette and there's no other, there's no redundancy in the system for any mode, um, whether it's vehicle, transit, bike or walk, there's just no redundancy. Um, so when we talk about the equity portion, and, and I saw just as this was handed out that the proposed selection criteria, which I'm happy to see that we're gonna be discussing selection criteria, um, equity is not part of that. Um, so we should probably be thinking about how we put equity into the selection criteria for projects, but then what projects do we even need to put into the conversation because they're not even in, they're not in the RTP because we hadn't necessarily as a whole ODOT region, not even thought about adding that additional project in, um, in order to mitigate, um, specifically for equity. So Programmatically on the tolling side, I, I can see where we're kind of heading um, in, in trying to create a programmatic equity program. I'm not sure that systematically on the ground, we're gonna be achieving equity. So how do, we, how do we combine those two as we go forward, I guess is the question. Because it's not just projects that are in the STIP, it's potentially projects that aren't even in it yet. Right. I, I mean, I appreciate the comments and I think that um, that's the benefit of a group like this, right, is to have conversations about um, what's planned versus what else could be for the analysis as we move forward. That's the, the tension is that we need to rely on what's already been documented and planned. And so um, to the best of our ability, we try to match those up. Um, as information is changing and evolving. Um, but I think that um, you, even if something, some project isn't included in NEPA, it doesn't mean that it can't, it can't still move forward at regional level. And so I think continuing the conversations here about the broader system approach will help us as we're moving forward. Um, and there are some limitations to NEPA. You know, NEPA can only do its one, one part. So I'll just, ask for a follow-up and I feel like the director is going to answer the question. Um, I don't want to walk away hearing, thinking that I heard from you, we can't do that because NEPA does not allow it. Not at all. I was trying to say the opposite yeah. thing. Yeah. Okay. Right. And that, I, that's what I think the benefit of this sort of group conversation is. Yeah, I'll just confirm. I think Mandy captured that well, uh, and in the in the statements, actually, both from uh, the commissioner and President Peterson, uh, a couple of things that come to mind. Um, NEPA has constraints as it relates to how the analysis is performed based upon the RTP and the other structures that we have in place. Uh, I think what I'm hearing in the comment is there's toll related impacts, uh, and there's also, frankly, access related impediments or gaps in the system that exist today. So even if tolling weren't to go forward and the Abernathy bridge construction were not to go forward, uh, and I'm not suggesting that by the way, I wanna be clear, uh, but even if those things weren't to go forward, we still have a conversation for our region and our community that says we have existing gaps that need to be discussed and need to be uh, talked about as to how we wanna fund them uh, because they're important enough uh, and those gaps have existed for too long for us to let them be as they are. Is that safe? Yeah. I I actually think there is, and this is probably to the next conversation, a nexus to the project mm -hmm. um, because what you, what you've an analyzed is how do you re basically reduce a toll to provide for that opportunity, that accessibility that might have been too big of a burden, but there might be projects that do the same thing even better, or you need both in order to actually have an equity outcome that, right. that yeah. actually achieves an outcome. <laughs> yeah, and I think the tension there, uh, as we've been talking about, is there might be a project, say, that uh, provides an opportunity for somebody to never get on the interstate, for example, right? They can make that trip in another way. The question becomes, how is that paid for? Do we regionally agree on that? Uh, and is that an impact or is it a, is a, uh, a mitigation associated with tolling? Or is it um, a combination of that as well as 
uh, a need that we have in the region that we should be talking about. And it feels like it's a little bit of both. Uh, and um, I, I'd agree. I think we've been focused uh, pretty heavily on the policy and programmatic framework of establishing uh, an equity-based toll program. Uh, but there are project uh, improvements that could occur throughout the region that might actually benefit that as well. Uh, I'm not convinced we'll capture all of them as a region, but I think having that conversation uh, is valuable. Okay, let's go to Shannon and then Jana and then James. Thanks, David. Uh, I, you know, I have another comment, but I want to say I appreciate uh, this this discussion. I noticed in the one of the key themes from the um, the polling was that you know transit isn't seen as a viable alternative, right? So that really shows us that that there is this need for a coordinated investment in this across the system uh, beyond just the main line and and ideally beyond just the diversion routes as well. So, um, and I, I want to say also, thank you for your earlier uh, responsiveness to Commissioner Mapp's letter. Uh, you know, this has been a big focus for us and I know he uh, regrets not being able to be here, <laughs> um, but really appreciate that and appreciate the offer as well to uh, coordinate a, a, perhaps a presentation to the OTC. Um, uh, hopefully that request resonated with the rest of the members of the RTAC. And uh, part of, Part of our uh, thought in putting that into the letter was just um, recognizing the cost burden that um, will be associated with this project across the region and, and to the residents here specifically. Um, you know, it, for anyone that's been following uh, the debates on the cost of parking in downtown Portland, <laughs> uh, may know that our office has been working on this quite a bit. And um, I think we appreciate the, the work on the equity framework because this is really the, the communities that are the tip of the spear in, in that cost burden. Um, but that, you know, th these are these are costs that the other residents in the region will be um, experiencing as well. So to that end, I was really um, I was interested to see that, um, again, some of the tolling um, was that the the key themes are actually pretty consistent with other um, other communities um, that are uh, with the rest of the population and over time um, and that, you know, uh, folks are interested in seeing a fair proposal. And um, they want to see their voices heard in decision making. I guess I, I was curious: are there are there areas where um, the, the this particular group had different um, concerns than than sort of the rest of the population that that you've been addressing? Or 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 do you see that? Because there was a mention that there's consistency with the rest of the population and over time. Yeah, let me go back to my notes. I think I mentioned a couple um, where there were just more pronounced. Um, concerns or interests. Hey, let me, excuse me. Um, the piece I want to kind of piggyback to what you're asking there, Shannon. And it's like when you go out and you reach out to these communities, okay, you have to understand they're not in the room, they're not in the weeds like we are. They're looking at their lives. And so what folks see is, I can't afford to pay anything for tolling. I don't want to, my business, my small business can't afford additional cost. So it's to say the price of tolling need to stay down because that is what they are faced with. When you look at the transit challenges, when you look at people met last week with uh, the city of Gresham's transit uh, subcommittee, and they're talking about the challenges that they're having out in East County with um, getting people to viable jobs, getting people to education and training facilities. And so, they see that they do not have the same level of transit available to them. That's what's reflected here. This is people are reflecting their feelings of what they're living with and what they see. They're not thinking about, you know, oh, well, there's a regional transportation plan and we need to do our part to feed into that regional transportation plan. You know what I hear? I hear, how come they're doing all this on the east side? Why aren't they doing this over on the west side? Okay, and so that's why the voices, when you reach out to the CBAs and the people in the community, they're much more focused on 
real challenges, less so on billions of dollars in future revenue. So I think that just helps to contextualize the uh, feedback that you get uh, when you reach out to the community. Thank you, James. Jenna? Thank you. And to further contextualize, I think we need to go back to House Bill 2017. I mean, the legislature tried to pass a transportation package in 2015 and it failed. I know because I was there. And their choice then was to get on the road and go out and talk to all the communities around the state and identify projects. And that was the basis for the package that came together. And for the significant increases that you all are paying um, through your gas tax and certainly the trucking industry is paying through their weight mile taxes. And I, it seems to me and some of this gets caught up in our, our individual meanings and our definitions of the word equity, et cetera. But it seems to me that we're getting so um, distracted by trying to create perfection here in terms of trying to develop all the projects around this that are going to make the system be perfect. And we've lost the focus of the decisions that were made by a group of elected officials in 2017. We haven't delivered those packages yet. And now we're starting to talk about a new transportation package, and it's gonna be hard for folks like me to come to the table and be productive in that conversation because we're so busy trying to figure out all the other things we need to do. The idea, the concept of tolling in House Bill 2017 was pretty straightforward, generic. Um, it was a recognition that those mega projects in order to, to pay for those mega projects, we would have had to raise the gas tax so significantly that um, the rest of the state would have rebelled. And, and you and I have all witnessed in the past groups that have come to forward and repealed gas tax increases. And so the concept was to create tolling in the Portland region because the cost of the mega projects to offset the cost of the mega projects. House Bill 3305 really come has extended that concept and created the equity conversation around it. And I have to confess to you, I've lobbied in this state for over 25 years. There wasn't much conversation around equity in House Bill 3305. It was a virtual session, very limited testimony. We weren't meeting in person. We just weren't having those conversations. And so everybody has their personal definition of what that means. And I think it's getting very, very complicated. And we're not being able to get back to trying to help ODOT deliver on the projects they were responsible to deliver for in the original package. And I certainly we all recognize that the more payers we have into the system, the less the cost has to be. I mean, the, the more we exempt this group and that group and this group, pretty soon the costs are going to be cost prohibitive for all of us. And you and I both know the initiative process here in this state can really change that paradigm pretty, pretty quickly. So I'm slightly frustrated, as you may well tell by the tone of my comments here today, but at the end of the day, we have historically had a transportation system that has been dependent on user fees. It's a concept of the user pays for the system. And now we're trying to create um, essentially um, a system dependent on income levels. And it's getting very, very complicated. And I don't know that we can ever come to a truly equitable outcome there. We've got to find a way to pay for the system that delivers what it is that this region needs. And so I will continue to try to be a productive player in that conversation, but I am, have to confess to you, I'm getting a little frustrated in some of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. We, we have time for one more comment or question, and then we need to move on. We have not heard from Commissioner Fye, so I'd like to uh, recommend uh, recognize Commissioner Fye. Uh, thank you, David. Good morning. And I think, um, Janet, you shared a lot of good information and good feelings, so I don't want to take away, but I do have a comment or a question, and that is just putting my public health hat and uh, uh, just appreciate the small respect public health is getting in here and especially in your Amanda slide uh, or Mandy sorry why did I call you uh, Mandy um, applying equity framework to the toll program 
um, you know, transportation is a social determinant of public health. And so I just wanted to recognize that and appreciate um, that respect and perhaps, you know, bubble or elevate that public health point because you'll have a lot of friends out there in the community that can relate to what you're trying to do around equity uh, framing uh, in connection to public health. So uh, just making a plug for public health there. Um, and then the the other comment I wanted to make um, is, you know, the conversation around um, existing or projects and how we're gonna address equity going forward, considering there's too many things to track around transportations. And one of the thing I appreciate seeing your second slide there um, was around considering existing conditions, which really gave me hope to say that, you know, we're really going to try to aim high and try to address equity. And then when you were talking about that slide, one of the thoughts I had or that came to me or an example was, you know, one of the good things that United Nations does around climate change is help people adapt. And that's what I thought about, like when you were presenting that slide, existing conditions, perhaps we're, we're, we need to come up with an adaptation plan because developing countries cannot do climate mitigations. So the UN pivots them to do climate adaptation. So, you know, how can you live with the climate problems that exist? So perhaps what we need is an adaptation plan to help low income and communities of color who are struggling in you've seen the overwhelming concerns that was expressed the themes slide. Uh, perhaps we need to add up, how do we help people adapt to this new addition to transportation systems in Oregon? Uh, so just not to distract, but um, just thought I would share that example of helping people adapt to tolling. Thank you, Commissioner. And I'll also note that EMAC has uh, many members that come from the interface of public health and transportation. So they help us keep that uh, connection and point of intersection um, at the forefront as well. All right. Thank you very much. Um, a reminder, you have your worksheet in front of you. Three important questions on equity, process equity, outcome equity, and lessons learned. Really want to hear from you. So please take the time to fill that out. Uh, before we pivot to the next meaty topic, Nexus Projects, I failed at the very beginning to recognize a few members of the committee who are joining us online. So uh, Dean and Denise, and if, if I missed anyone else, if you can please introduce yourself, your name and organization. Dean, I'll start with you. Uh, Dean Reynolds, um, Calix Indian Tribe. Denise, are you on? I'm here, Denise Harvey, Confederate Tribes of Grand Ronde Tribal Council. And is there anyone else online, any other member of the committee online we did not recognize earlier? Okay, so I think we have um, done all of our introductions. Um, now we're going to switch to another uh, big topic, that's Nexus Projects, and I'll hand it over to Brendan. Uh, thank you, David. Appreciate that. And um, and thanks for moving us along. Uh, but it is uh, important to hear voices while we're here as well. And um, I, I saw that the 10 cards uh, for the mayor and the commissioner are open. Thank you for, for moving us along. But I do want, want to give you a little space uh, while we're here since those two cards were up before I jump into this meaty topic. So, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um and I certainly appreciate all, Mandy's gone back there, but I appreciate all the work we, we've done this far on the equity component. Uh, I just wanted to add one one thought, which is that that I think James kind of brought up with the east side versus west side tolling issue. Um, I think in addition to focusing on marginalized communities and low income folks, I think we should also look at what I would call locational equity or regional equity surrounding the the location of tolls and making sure that one one or two or three cities aren't disproportionately targeted or burdened by tolling in their communities versus the whole region that benefits from the project so i think that's another component of equity that i'd like to see discussed and reflected but that's all i had to say thank you Mister. yeah i just wanted uh on the on the equity discussion i wanted to just add that um for those of you who watched and uh, 
participated or participated in Metro's regional panel discussion with people from around the country. Um, the gentleman from Atlanta, when we were talked about diversion, and I drilled deeper into this, uh, when we talked about diversion, he says, we don't have a problem in diversion in Atlanta. Uh, so because he, he, was, he was evaluating the analysis that was done at the time. And he attributed that, and quite accurately, he attributed that to the fact that they have an express lane model and also spoke greater about the equity uh, impacts and who is actually in those express lanes and who is not in those express lanes. So they weren't Lexus lanes, if you will. But as I drilled down deeper into the Atlanta model, for example, um, and I it also recollected what I said five years ago at the, at the tolling advisory committee, which Jana and I and others here in this room were on, was that I think we're creating problems we don't need to create. And uh, I, I'm, I'm if we look at the express lane model, I think that the this EMAC program would look quite differently, right? Or maybe less less of a financial cost. So I'm just thinking about the mitigation projects and all the things under this tolling scenario that are going to be so expensive that perhaps the net 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 is actually negative versus other models where you can actually see a plus. You can turn that negative number into a plus. And I don't think that evaluation has been done. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. So I'll jump right in. Uh, we led with equity. Um, that's what we heard. Now we're going to talk a little bit away about how we operationalize that and how that's reflected in the work that we do. I think President Peterson teed that up rather well. Um, we thought this that discussion would lead well uh, into this one. Uh, but before we do, um, before I do, and I just have a couple of slides because we want to get to the discussion, uh, that's the more important part, is also uh, to demonstrate over and over again that we're hearing, we're listening, and we're responding. Uh, so I do want to talk a little bit about the process we've had since our last meeting uh, to determine how we're going to move forward uh, with this uh, Nexus project uh, process, which is really what we're here to talk about today. Uh, President Peterson mentioned some of the criteria. Uh, we're going to go over a definition of a Nexus project. We're going to talk a little bit about the selection criteria that we'd like to use to get your, your feedback on. Some of that came out of the charter uh, that we, we put together. Um, other parts, and I, I want to give a nod to Sarah from Street Trust uh, for giving us some great input in uh, adding some selection criteria that we have right now for our Great Streets uh, program. So you'll see that embedded in our slides. I apologize. I'll be reading a couple bullets. I'll try to be uh, rather quick. But since we, uh, I sent an email to you and your staffs um, kind of calling for a, a list of projects, um, I, I got a lot of feedback. And I really want to thank, we did have some office hours uh, where many of the staff attended. They're back here. I uh, want to thank them, uh, normally not thanked enough uh, for all the work that they do uh, behind the scenes uh, for all of us to be successful. Uh, so thank you for your input. I did hear loud and clear, wow, Brendan, you know, we're not quite ready for this. Uh, we need to understand the process a little bit better. Uh, so hopefully that's reflective here. Uh, and again, I, uh, you'll see some of this, uh, some of the changes and some of the, the pieces here on timing reflect the comments we heard from Commissioner Maps, which were endorsed by Mayor Bubinick and others. Uh, so hopefully that that hits the mark. Um, but I also want to talk about some other comments that were submitted as well. Um, it has been a long journey uh, the, I've been a part of in the past five years uh, around this process, and I, I really appreciated the comments that came from uh, Executive Director of the Port of Portland, Mr. Robinhold, who's been a part of this journey as well. Uh, the three positions that you staked out uh, in your, and this is all in your packets, hopefully you all got to take a look at it. I remember at the time were endorsed by uh, the city of Portland as I was representing that entity uh, at the similar table to this one back then, uh, but are now endorsed by, uh, by ODOT now. So thank you in those thoughtful remarks, uh, Mr. Robinhold, and uh, how they focused on moving us forward. Uh, what can we do? How can we get this the right? So uh, we love that, uh, obviously, ideology uh, and philosophy as we as we move this forward. So um, with that, I'll go to my next slide. And again, I only have a couple of them. Uh, and I'm going to read this out. It's in your packet. Um, some of this deals, now you'll see on the second bullet about how we 
define uh, some of the ex equity pieces. Uh, but right now we have this working definition again for us to workshop here. Um, we don't have to get all the answers. Again, we, we wanna hear your feedback. Uh, we're not gonna make that final decision here on this working definition. Uh, but Nexus projects are a roadway, bike, pedestrian, or other mobility projects or programs that could complement a tolling system on I-5 and I-205 in the Portland metropolitan area by addressing anticipated negative impact or improving access to public transportation or improving mobility options near the tolled highway and providing access to opportunity or address transportation related disparities and barriers experienced by the toll projects equity framework communities. Now, I'm going to go through, we'll get to a point where David will facilitate a conversation, particularly on this working definition. So I'm going to move on to the selection criteria, which we'll, we'll also talk about as well. I want to get through these slides so we can jump right in. Uh, again, this is a combination of what's in your charter. Um, and then what is uh, been incorporated in ODOT's Great Streets program uh, for selection criteria as, uh, and I'll, I'm going to get to the timeline of how we, we move some of this forward to uh, after I do this. Project readiness, uh, is it included in a regional transportation plan uh, or a local plan, but that doesn't have to be it, uh, as to President Peterson's point. Early planning conducted, public engagement, uh, complete completeness of project design. Uh, safety, I know, is a, a huge uh, priority for many at this table, or all at this table, uh, as it addresses safety need. Uh, traffic operations, does it improve reliability and support congestion relief? The urgency of the need uh, addresses essential repair or provides a critical connection. And obviously climate, which we talked a lot about, uh, contributes to vehicles while traveled and greenhouse gas emission reduction. Next slide. There's only two on selection criteria. Transit, uh, is it, does it connect to or expand access to public transportation or complement a public transportation strategy project and or supportive service? Benefits, provides benefits to the community, economy, and environment. Thanks for letting me read these bullets. Uh, ownership, the proposer owns the facility or has knowledge of owner support. Geography, located within the impacted corridor as defined by the Oregon Highway Plan or in a metro in a metro mobility corridor. Funding, does it leverage existing or future funding opportunities? It's going to be local, federal, or state. And then project cost, uh, project development, construction, and maintenance. Next slide. So how are these things uh, nesting in with each other? Um, we heard a lot of comments about uh, the work that's been done already, um, as you can see on this timeline, the upper part is for the public transportation strategy. The lower part is more of the work that we're conducting uh, here with this group. Uh, as you can see, that call for projects that's happening. Uh, we're here at this point in June 26 to talk about Nexus project definition and selection criteria. Um, uh, okay, it's in your packet, but it got reviewed or got removed from this slide uh, where the project management groups will be meeting again uh, in between now and or they're trying to schedule in between that July 11th time. Um, we have our next meeting on July 24th. We'll finalize this selection criteria. Then uh, we'll be taking a break in August, um, as people like to do uh, here in Oregon, um, but we will be wor still working on Nexus projects as we'll be uh, at the end of July looking for that call for projects. And uh, then on September 18th, we'll be back here uh, again uh, to discuss submitted projects and based on selection criteria. And then October, our TAC meeting uh, will refine Nexus and public transportation strategy project list and determine next steps. Before we get into the discussion, and I turn it back over to David, uh, a lot of this timeline is driven by our response to the governor. Um, we talked about this last time we met. We we owe her in a, uh, an implementation uh, reports uh, for diversion and mitigation. Uh, this, uh, obviously, piece is going to be uh, uh, critical to that. So uh, again, that's that's a little bit of what's driving uh, the timing on this. So uh, thank you for letting me uh, talk through those slides with you. And I'm going to turn it over to David to facilitate a discussion. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Brendan, uh, for walking us through this. Well, let's talk about what you just heard. Uh, and let's start with uh, the first thing Brendan brought up, which is the proposed definition of Nexus project. What are your thoughts 
Uh, do you generally support it? Do you think it's heading in the right direction? Do you think it needs work? Uh, and so this is your chance to weigh in. Uh, I see JC. Is that JC? Yeah, that is JC. Uh, let's start with JC and then Commissioner Savis, and we'll we'll go on, go around. And JC, before why don't we bring up that definition on the PowerPoint there, just so we can have it handy for people to look at? Thank you. So my question for you, Brendan, is this: So we know that some of these nexus projects are beyond the mitigations. I, how do I want to put this? We know that there's there's going to be mitigation needed for the project to be successful, right? How are those funded first? Then there's a then there's a transportation pro transportation plan added on top of that, and then there are nexus projects which are even beyond all of that. How how do we know those kind of three buckets? What those all look like, and do we have any even just to fund? The mitigation efforts does that i hope that makes sense. it does that's how i'm looking it at does it yeah no uh, uh good question jc appreciate that um obviously through the the nepa process we'll, we'll be using modeling to identify mitigation measures that that needed to be done to satisfy some of our regulatory requirements um i think we uh have said and will continue to say that's not enough um we we need to look at other efforts and again looking at it more comprehensively director strickler talked a little bit about um what's going to happen beyond mitigation and what possibilities will happen into the future as far as uh, funding is concerned. Um, I know that's, we know that's a discussion the legislature wants to have. So um, we'll be getting, we'll be getting to that point, but that, the mitigation pieces that relate to uh, what a tolling system is going to do uh, for us uh, to get this finding of no significant impact, um, those will be baked into the to project costs. Thank you. Commissioner Savas. So uh, I don't I don't have any quarrel. I think that's that's fine. What's up up there on the screen there as far as that uh, what we we sat in on that meeting and what we realized we had a couple aha moments before the meeting and after the meeting when we posed questions to our our transportation staff engineers and so forth and that was was this um, and also the other aha moment which came up at the JPAC which was geez our TSPs, the jurisdictions, transportation system plans, uh, anticipated the I-205 corridor, for example, being the bottleneck. It's in there. It's in the RTP, uh, being repaired, widened, bridge replaced, all of that upgraded, uh, but not tolling. And the second aha moment, if our TSP doesn't recognize that uh, tolling, um, nor does everyone else's. And here we are engaged in a regional conversation parallel to this, not associated, but parallel to this, and updating our RTP, which we do every five years. And Metro plays a big role in that RTP. And so as I stated here a couple of weeks ago out of the JPAC meeting, our RTP draft just went out and it's already outdated because it doesn't factor in the impacts tolling. So I would say, and my, probably I know my staff would also say that, for example, Stafford Road or Lima Falls Drive, where we have deep culverts, there's no shoulder, we want, we want transit on those. Those would look differently if tolling actually happened. And by the way, this model of tolling versus other model of tolling, I think needs to be sorted out first. If it's going to be this approach, tolling all lanes, then the, the, the project list will be severe, I mean, significant. So I, in a way, I think we need to pause and then consider how we reset, because if we don't have good data to drive the projects that we really need, and we don't exactly know what the tolling project will look like, if again, if it is this, if the assumption is what was in the EA, uh, and we don't even have the RMPP data, right, because that's going to complicate it even more, that's going to drive more people off the system onto these local roads, that list will be tremendous and expensive. But how much time does it actually take? for us to redevelop our, our, our TSPs to calculate in what we actually need for projects that meet all that criteria and all the other, which I don't disagree with. So I think that's why we need to pause and kind of reset and figure out how we actually approach this to do it in a, in a comprehensive, responsible way to the taxpayers, as opposed to just, they're, I won't say they're pie in the sky, they're just hypothetical projects that the governor is gonna see, perhaps when we give her that list and the cost. But my concern is that it, does, it doesn't feel like it's we're approaching this in a very sophisticated manner. And um, yeah, I've said that's it's kind of frustrating when I, when I realized that we're, we didn't factor this in 
our TSPs or RTP. Let's go to Mayor Ann and then uh, Sean Donahue, who is joining us on Zoom. Thank you, David. My question got answered. Go ahead and go to Sean. Sean, you are recognized. Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to say that I agree with the comments that were made uh, by JC and Commissioner Savas. I've worked in a few other areas where we've talked about these sort of nexus projects in relation to overarching projects that exist. And typically what happens in these are uh, some of them are funded through the revenue generation of these programs, but by and large, the vast majority of whatever the fallout is from uh, or potential opportunities that exist from an implementation of, let's just say, the tolling program falls on, on the local or the county to be able to resolve those issues. Uh, and I, I would agree that I think we need to take a step back and really sort of examine what the potential outcomes of these projects are on the periphery and where additional revenue generation may be needed as a function of the project to help solve those problems, either pedestrian or diversion of traffic that will impact uh, local cities that probably don't necessarily have the bandwidth in their current condition to be able to do those, uh, or they may have uh, sort of competing interest in terms of uh, cities that are trying to create road diet situations for their own safety reasons, but then we'll see extensive diversion as a function of the tolling project. Um, so I, I just wanted to echo those comments. I, I appreciated them, and especially on the transit piece, like how, uh, you know, I appreciated JC's comments about uh, how do we take a project and manage all of the other individual projects that will be a byproduct of it, uh, especially in the transit sphere, because those can get uh, a little pricey. And so we just need to make sure that we're managing the outcomes the best way we can for the people who are legitimately going to be impacted. And I think it goes all the way back to uh, President Peterson's comment about, you know, what is the true equity outcome that we're looking for? Someone's going to end up uh, getting stuck with uh, the smaller outcomes that could turn into big dollars later on down the road. I just want to make sure that we're we're being aware of what those are in real time. Thank you, Sean. And a reminder for others who are also online, uh, Denise and Denise, Denise and Dean, if you have any comments, please use the raised hand function. Uh, we'll go to President Peterson, followed by Mayor Rory. Thank you. I'm going to sit on this definition because I, I, I think it's a good start, um, but I think I need some time to process it in specificity. Um, I don't want to edit it in real time um, or debate. Uh, I think that it's a good start though. I guess what I wanted to parse apart to create the beginning of a conversation around a framework for this discussion is that I think it's really important that the financial plan is married with a project list. <laughs> and that is the important outcome that we have around this table to get to. Of, um, and I think there's three types of projects that we're looking at, and I think we need to distinguish as we each put them on the table. Are they an existing problem on the system because I-205 is congested, right? We all have that list of projects. Some of those are in the RTP, some of them are not. Um, it just It's dependent upon how the jurisdictions have put and prioritized projects for the five, 10, 15, 20 year of a 20 year plan. So if there's an existing impact, it seems that that's a priority. And then there's the opening day impact of whatever it is we choose. And then there's the long-term impacts as congestion increases over time. So I think there's three different ways that we can sort these projects and start thinking about them because then that goes to the funding and the financing plan. Tolling and RMPPP, as, as you have suggested, Director, are paying for I-205 project, the project itself for the expansion of the, of the lanes. So that's for 30 years. In the meantime, we do have MTIP money that the region could be putting towards mitigation in this corridor writ large. There is a transportation package to be discussed. And then there's the future revenue of RMPP. And I don't wanna get hung up on the future revenue of RMPP until we can figure out what the long-term impacts could be in that 20-year modeling. But we do need to have the project list of existing and opening day. And I think those are the most important things that we need to 
really focus on and then the long-term impacts and the future revenue of our MPP, I think those are going to need to be married so that we that we all have some sort of commitment that there is future funding for things that we could not have foreseen and will happen. Um, so I, I think if we could break it down into that framework, it would help move both the financial plan and the project list, which if we don't get our act together now, we will miss 2025. And so I just want to say I'm committed to helping, and I know our staff are committed to helping work out these things so that we are ready for that discussion um, so that we're not spiraling the drain as these lists are being created, and they will start that pretty darn soon to get ready for 2025. So we have to, we, we have to get really focused really fast, um, and that would be my, my ask is that we, we start to really create a framework that helps us make decisions as quickly as we possibly can without leaving anybody out. But we need to get those lists in front of people so they can start thinking about it. Thanks. Thank you, President Peterson. We'll go to Mayor Rory, followed by Denise Harvey, who's online, and then Mayor Ann. Thank you. And thank you for all the comments made so far. I agree with all of them. Um, I have a couple of comments on the Nexus project discussion. Um, First of all, one thing that I've been wrestling with in my head relates to the NEPA process and how in this definition we're saying addressing an anticipated impact, addressing an anticipated negative impact, but yet in the environmental assessment, all impacts are supposed to be mitigated. So I feel like we're admitting here today that the environmental assessment is flawed in that way because uh, not all impacts have been mitigated if there's into future anticipated negative ones. I think we need to reconcile that because the regulatory process is what has teeth going forward to actually ensure that things are funded. Um, the other just issues that I have are surrounding the idea of everybody coming up with a project list. The city has a TSP and it may be outdated as Commissioner Savas mentioned with, with tolling and not anticipating that, but we have tens of millions, if not a hundred million dollars of projects in there that could potentially uh, qualify as a Nexus project. And I'm sure other cities around Mayor Twalton may have a, a guidance from his city, but we could end up with a list of 500 to $700 million in Nexus projects. and. But when we look at the tolling revenue projections for at least the I-205 that we heard earlier, it's going to be difficult to just pay for the project itself. So I just feel like we're going about this. We should take a step back in part because of the NEPA issues, but also because we are going at this in a way that doesn't have a clear path to funding. Uh, so we're, when we come up with projects, I feel like we'll get to the end and be disappointed because we may only have a million or $2 million each. You know, I think a revenue sharing discussion would be uh, appreciated as part of this, because I know with gas tax, we get the 50, 30, 20, uh, 50 state, 30 county, 20% of the gas tax to the cities. You know, maybe we could do something like that with tolling, but I feel like we're setting ourselves up for uh, a lot of hope and then disappointment when funding doesn't realize uh, but, you know, and then the dat lack of data, uh, I really want to make decisions based on data. And, you know, I can come up with things that I think may be impacted and our staff can as well, but the modeling should match up. And it's clear based on the EA that it doesn't match up to what we're talking about. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity and I appreciate that we're going towards the project discussion because I think you have, ODOT has heard that we want to see projects, um, more mitigation. I just would like to take a step back, I guess, and support my colleagues in that because we're, uh, feels like jumping the gun a little bit in terms of not knowing the full picture of revenue, which is a crit critical component of this. So thank you. Sorry to take a little bit of time here. Thank you, Mayor. Denise Harvey, you are next. You're online. And then we'll go to Mayor Ann and Keith Lynch from FHWA. Um, good morning. Um, just first of all, I want to apologize. I had planned on being there today, but had a family emergency last night, so wasn't able to. But I want to say I agree with a lot of the statements that are being made, except for, well, 
is what I keep hearing when you speak of the Native American and the tribes of Oregon, that they're in the equity issue. They're being lumped in with all the other equity concerns. And granted, I am passionate and concerned about those issues, but tribes are sovereign nations and we need to be treated as a sovereign nation and tribal government and um, not always put into the same category as some of the other equity issues that are being mentioned. Each time I heard tribes being mentioned, they were put in a category with um, other concerns. And um, these toll roads are in the homelands of the Grand Ronde tribe. So I just want to make it aware that I think when you're having those discussions with us or other tribes that they need to be dealt with on a separate, um, in a separate way. Um, granted, this is a big project. There are a lot of, a lot of things to figure out. Um, and you guys have a lot, everybody has a lot of work to do on this. I am concerned with toll roads. I'm very familiar with toll roads as I spent a large portion of my life in California. I can't say, I feel like they work. <laughs> um, they, there's continued congestion um, regardless of the toll roads. Um, and I do think I, you know, recognize the concerns that, you know, people brought up about the climate change issues and how do we come up with a plan that is best for the future of Oregon and um, resolve these issues. So look forward to continuing the work together and, um, that's about it. All I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. David, can I make a recognition there? Oh, yes. Well, yes. Um, just that we will uh, point very well taken. Uh, we will um, respond. We will have our government to government relations. It, it is different. Denise, I just want to recognize that um, and uh, and recognize the sovereignty and, and the relationship that we have as government to governments. And that will be uh, separate from this process. And so just duly noted, just wanted to make a point of uh, that that will be the case. And uh, thank you for bringing it up. Thanks, Brendan. Mary thank Ann? you. Yes, thank you, Brendan. I'm sure you're aware of the fact, but I'd just like to remind folks as we're talking about the mitigation for equity and transit and capital projects within the region, there are extreme limitations on how you're going to fund any of that in Clark County. So the limitations of funding anything capital, anything with equity, anything with transit in Clark County is a constitutional issue. So um, I'm not sure there's anything that you can do with it in the short term, but we'll need to consider all of that. I don't have an incredibly good answer right now, uh, Madam Mayor, but you do point out that and that's something that we wanna continue to discuss. Thank you. Let's go to Keith, followed by Commissioner Savas and Shannon. Uh, thank you, David. Um, <clears throat> Just a word on NEPA. Um, we know there's lots of talk about mitigation versus, you know, the impacts that we're going to have uh, with a tolling project. Of course, there will be some impacts. Um, the things that the, the federal government through NEPA demands is not everything. Uh, so NEPA has a limited scope. Um, it's concerned with a broad variety of environmental topics, of course, uh, and equity being one of them. Um, so it is important, of course, that wherever we see, and there are there are communities in, in the corridor that are low income and minority, but that's the focus of NEPA, um, which is low income and minority communities and the impacts that, that this project will have on them. Um, and there will be requirements for uh, adverse and disproportionate impacts on those communities, uh, which, which we will basically work with the project sponsor, ODOT, to uh, implement strategies to mitigate that. Um, but it isn't anything. If, if, there are diver if there is diversion off of the main route, I-5, into other communities and there is increased congestion, NEPA will not demand that that be corrected. Um, that will be something that this group and ODOT and others will work with um, together to come up with some good ideas and strategies to make the transportation system work as well as it can work. Uh, that will not be something that the feds or NEPA itself will, uh, will insist on. Um, I'll also add that even 
the word mitigation is limited. It, it is not mitigation to correct all impacts, even to those required things. It is to correct impacts below a significant level uh, or to, to an insignificant level, below an, an in, uh, significant level. So there really are impacts even beyond, um, uh, you know, how, how, this, how this operates. And one of the things that did come up earlier that I also wanted to mention was, um, you know, about the, the costs of those mitigation projects. You know, they get baked into the, into the project, as we talked about, but that means an increase in the project cost overall. So that impacts uh, the funds that are available um, for other types of things as well. Um, because once those, once those mitigation projects go into the NEPA document, they become requirements and they must be put in place uh, for the project. But again, I just wanted to kind of give some clarifying comments about um, that scope of NEPA and how far that really goes and maybe some limitations on how far it doesn't go. Keith, thank you very much. Really important comments. I think there's a lot of confusion around NEPA, where it goes, what it does and does not cover. So Thank you for that. Uh, let's go to Commissioner Savas and then Shannon and Sarah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> again, I appreciate the exercise of this Nexus call out a request. Um, I just don't, we're not ready. And I think Mayor Bubenek's letter, uh, email, I don't want to, I know it to get circulated to the membership here. So you don't know exactly what I'm speaking to. Um, but I think what's pointed out there is really the heart of what's a number of the local jurisdictions in Clackamas County and Washington County are agreeing upon and, and others um, is that, you know, there's not enough time to put together a sophisticated list. So if you're asking our engineers to instead, instead of calculating in the professional matter that would meet that criteria, we're going to ask them to speculate. And I, I don't think that's not, again, I know that's not your intention, but it it it's becomes a reality. Um, and while it's exciting, I, I hear President Peterson say, you know, the projects that are ready to go are, are in place on opening day. Um, that's just 18 months away. There's no money. And the dire uh, forecast that was alluded to by Director Strickler uh, alarms me that if there's not enough money to finish the lanes, how is there going to be any money for any mitigation projects on opening day? Uh, it's quite the quandary, but I, I can't sit here today and say we're ready to go to submit. And, and here's the roadmap to do that. I'm not disagreeing. That's not a good framework, as President Peterson said, for the roadmap. I don't think we're in the, in the right place at the time and have enough time to do it, period. Very challenging. Thank you, Commissioner. Sarah? I'm sorry, Shannon. Oh, I, 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 Director, do you want to respond to that or? I, so Go thank ahead. you. Um, I, I guess a couple of things. I, I certainly hear the anxiety and the tension and the frustration with that. Uh, I'm an engineer myself. I don't want you to speculate because frankly, I think that's what's gotten us here. I think the speculation has created some of the tension and the anxieties that uh, we're experiencing around the table. And I would like to see the data. Uh, but I'm also reacting to, I think I've heard from at least our team that the staff conversation has yielded some pretty direct conversation that's data-based. Uh, and I think there might be disagreement in the data, right? There's disagreement around some of the analysis in the EA or those kinds of things. But I guess I want to be I want to be careful as to not perjure the, the work that's been done, uh, frankly, by all parties, uh, ODOT staff, agency staff uh, of our partners. I actually think that there's been quite a bit of work that's defined what the impacts could be. And then there's those others that I think we are speculating some, uh, but without that project list that, again, I think that we've heard has been at least on the minds of some around the table, uh, we don't know what the target is or what the universe is that we're looking at. Again, I'm not suggesting that we should be focusing on a wish list that we know is unattainable. That's not what I'm getting at. Uh, but I am suggesting that without the conversation, uh, we're going to be right back in the same conversation with, frankly, the same level of dialogue a year from now. And I think we can all agree that we have different outcomes that we want for the region in mind. And so I guess that's what I'm really focused on is how do we frame the conversation so that we can have that part of the dialogue uh, without putting us into a situation where we wish we had. That's really what I'm focused on. Shannon and then Sarah. Thank you. Uh, so just want to say, I think 
you know, we looked at the definition and appreciated that it was broad enough to accommodate um, lots of different types of projects. I think that will lead to a difficulty in prioritizing. <laughs> Clearly, that's part of the conversation here. Um, but beyond that, you know, I think we're happy to to work on a project list. I do think it will help this group move faster and um, and to not miss, you know, our next opportunity to talk about uh, funding and um, and really move this process forward. At the same time, I wanted to recognize and agree with Mayor Rory's comments about uh, the need for uh, more more of a look at finances and um, and really looking at revenue sharing as a possibility. I mean, clearly the funding here, you know, depends on the scenario that's selected for tolling, depends on the dollar amount, the toll level, um, but it also depends on the, the available funding for Nexus projects depends on the percentage of those revenues that are put towards Nexus projects. Um, if there's not any, you know, if there's not funding available after the main line is completed, then we're looking at, you know, what other, um, you know, whether the level of state support is there for these types of things. So um, just wanted to make a note that that we'd love to, uh, the city of Portland would would like to continue to engage on that revenue side as we put together the project list and, and see that as a really, uh, those two need to be continuing to tie together. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Sarah? I just wanted to express some of Commissioner Jayapal's concerns also about the list, um, just the lack of clarity around the prioritization, how they will be funded, what will be funded by tolling, what won't be funded by tolling. A lot of this has already been said. Um, and also just um, uh, to support what Shannon is saying, the, the importance of seeing local jurisdictions as partners and what would revenue sharing look like and how can we all um, partner together on making those improvements on and off the system. Thank you. Um, I see JC and President Peterson, and that's probably all the amount of time we have available for this, and then we'll move on to public comment. JC. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. President Peterson. Our line of sight is really bad. We'll have to cut down some trees. Um, I, uh, I guess I just wanted to, again, in problem solving mode, try and put out a framework for uh, this Nexus definition conversation. Um, because I don't think we, I think we as a region want to take advantage of this opportunity to deal with a transportation system that's very lacking in this area. Again, the redundancy, the, the local connectivity, the transit connectivity, the bike and ped connectivity is a huge issue. Um, and so I think getting the projects out that create a better transportation system in this area is the most important thing. The second important thing is to start taking those projects and using them as case studies of what, what is attributable to tolling and what is attributable to just the bare problem that we have in the background. And so I guess my bigger question is, we have a lot of staff that are working around this issue. And they're not really in a formal role to support us as an RTAC. And I think we should think about empowering them as a team to start helping us frame up these issues and not leaving it to this table, which is great. There's a lot of policy discussion going on, but we need implementation. And I know where that happens. Um, we have JPAC, but we also have TPAC, and TPAC actually helps move everything along because they are in problem-solving mode to get to that project list, to get results. Um, and so, you know, we can dicker about a definition, we can dicker, but we, we have a transportation need. There are different ways to financially solve that transportation need. We need to start out with a list and start going through the case studies and saying, how does this look when we apply these criteria? How does this play out? And can we move something forward that gets us moving in the right direction? And again, enemy is, perfection is the enemy of the good. I'm not looking for perfection. I'm looking for some conversation about real projects. And then what does the existing, if we go with that definition, what does that mean? And do we need to then change our definition? Or do we need to look at other ways to fund these projects because they will be needed? So that's my exasperation for the day. Let's just get moving um, on a conversation, even though it may not be perfect and make some assumptions. And if we have to change those assumptions as we go along, because we are learning together and can we empower that staff 
to actually help us move that along. Thanks. Thank you, JC. And then we'll go to one more com uh, comment from Sarah I, since we've not heard from her today. JC. My quick question, Brendan, when will we understand or know about that first level of projects, the, the mitigation efforts, those required by NEPA and the, and the overall cost of those? When will, do we know kind of a time frame from those? Yeah. So we have those for, for I-205. Okay. Um, and those are, those are in the environmental assessment docket. We have, we do not have those for RMPP yet um, as we're not in the nascent stages, but moving forward, we do expect to have some of that data that uh, Commissioner Savas, I think, is uh, anxiously uh, when you see uh, coming up this fall. So it will be, this is an iterative process. Um, we'll be learning more. Um, and as President Peterson just laid out, we will be adapting in the data to that as we as we make these considerations. So don't have it for RMPP yet, um, but we will have that initial data points here this fall. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah. Yes, thank you. Thanks for letting me squeak in under the radar there because I was not keeping track of time. Um, I just want to say a little bit to President Peterson's last point, but also to the comments that we submitted. There are a lot of good people who've been doing a lot of really good work for a long time. EMAC has already been at this far longer than we have, and your recommendations are solid. And when it comes to equity, we should just follow them. The Great Streets program that you set up has a really great framework where equity is about 25% of it. We have good working definitions. We have good working frameworks, which we can adapt, modify, and move on. And to Commissioner Fye's point, timing is important, not just to stand this up, as Curtis Robinhold says, but in order to adapt to changing times, we've seen what the pandemic can do. We actually can pivot fast. Uh, we saw what the legislature can do. 250 million out of the general fund for IBR, fast pivot. We can do things quickly when we need to and want to for the right reasons. And if mitigating and creating solutions that will keep people safe, keep them moving, address the needs of low income people, we can do that using existing processes, existing project lists, existing committees and tables to keep this moving forward. I do think, however, and thanks to the city of Portland and Commissioner Maps for forwarding this, that intensified coordination across the decision-making bodies and committees is important because to alleviate the anxiety, the shared problem solving and shared decision-making will help us move faster. It's not a burden for us to get together and talk. It's where we hash things out. So I think the rate setting committee and the rulemaking committees and the special committees and even the Joint Transportation Committee and all of the working groups who are gonna bring their talent and time and energy to this can actually help move this along faster. So we should probably treat this like the modest emergency of get her done that this is and, and scoot right along. But to my final point, that's where points four and five in our Nexus project selection uh, feedback are important because when you're moving quickly and as we're thinking about future planning and iterative processes, we have to be much more nimble and much more adaptive, which means in real time evaluation, especially for equity considerations. So stand something up, evaluate, monitor, ongoing, put that feedback into the next project. And let's put some of the technical capacity that we're known for around the world, frankly, in terms of transportation planning and execution of projects to really thinking about how that's equitably done. Because we have led for a very long time on standing up really good projects, but now we can stand up this and use our skills to evaluate and make sure that things are implemented equitably as we go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Well, this has been a robust and active conversation, uh, exactly what we need. And so for those of you who did not have a chance to weigh in, or if you have additional comments, again, please refer to the worksheet, uh, really need your feedback. And so take the time, if you will, to fill that out. Um, and there's also a, a, a Google version online. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you, Brendan, for leading us through uh, that discussion. We will now turn to public comment. We'll first start with those in the room, and, and then we'll go to uh, participants online. Um, Kirsten? We don't have anyone. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Nick, can I turn to you for any online comments? Yes. Let me go ahead and pull up the timer. 
And the first individual we'll call on is John McCabe. John, I'm going to go ahead and permit you to speak whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, John McCabe, uh, Stafford Area of West Lynn. Um, there's been a lot of talk today about uh, equity, and we were already told by uh, the Oregon Mobility Project that in our region, we're going to be paying an additional $600 due to tolling, which is a 9% increase in travel cost. So essentially in our area, we're gonna be paying 256% more than everybody else in the state of Oregon um, over what they pay for gas tax right now. So that is a form of equity that is not being discussed. And we've uh, brought this up with the Federal Highway Administration that we are being basically um, burdened so much more just like the city of Portland that pays an additional 10 cents per gallon because they were willing to take the effort. Um, and then there's the fear of the, uh, the tolling that it is really still gonna go ahead because we've already heard uh, through OTC that the gantry is going up next year on uh, I-205. And so we don't see how it's gonna be stopped. Then the other thing we always heard was electric cars is the reason why we don't have enough in, uh, gasoline tax. And the reality is, is a June 4th article, which used uh, DMV, is um, electric cars are less than 2% of the cars in the state of Oregon, only 66,000. That's not the problem. And as for gas tax being hard to get it past the voters, we've had a 10, we're uh, at the end of having a 10 cents per gallon increase over an eight year period. People now are willing to vote for a gas tax. They just wanna see something done. And tolling, we still have the problem with um, my, the, the diversion is not working in our area and it's not being dealt with. And OTC says it's gonna be paid for by um, grants and that's not enough. Thank you. Nick, any other online comments? We do. I'm going to go ahead and call on John Lay. John Lay, whenever you're ready, I've permitted you to unmute yourself. Good morning, members of the RTAC committee. Thank you so very much. I would like to emphasize some words that were shared with you earlier today. Commissioner Savas said, we're creating problems we don't need to create. He is exactly right. Additionally, Lynn Peterson said, we need to know what problems are attributable to tolling and what are attributable to other issues. Huge foot stompers. We know today 100% of the traffic diversion will be caused by tolling, not any other aspect of the Abernathy Bridge project. And therefore, when you look at trying to mitigate that, if you eliminated the tolling on all lanes, you would eliminate the majority of the traffic diversion, if not all of it. Back in 2018, the Value Pricing Committee was given eight options to consider for tolling. And overwhelmingly, one of those options created the most favorable outcomes in terms of improving traffic congestion, and it was also equitable. The focus of your discussions was equity. That option would build a new lane in each direction on I-5 and I-205 and only toll that new lane. It was phenomenal, and yet it was discarded by ODOT and their staff. Sadly, you should pivot back and reconsider that option. Finally, you have learned today there's 4.3 billion in funding demands and maybe only 1.1 billion in revenue coming. What happens if IP4 gets adopted by the citizens where they demand a vote before tolling is placed on any road. Bottom line to that is you will not get 1.1 billion in tolling revenues. You might have a total $4.3 billion hole in funding. You need to pivot now. Thank you. Nick, any other online commenters? And with that, uh, David, I'm not seeing any other individuals that have raised their hand. Okay, great. Thank you, Nick. All right, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, we have a few brief project updates from um, James Paulson, Commissioner Fye, and Mandy. 
James. All right. Excuse me. Kind of caught me by surprise. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, what we're doing it, sorry, my throat is we are continuing to work with EMAC as we look at having this additional time. And so we're using that additional time to um, reach out and get deeper feedback and deeper understanding. So up here on the board, you can thank you. Up here on the screen, you can see some of the activities that we have coming. Um, I'm not going to go through each of those activities individually, but one of the things that I really want to highlight is in July, we're putting a lot of work into a working session in which we're really going to take a much deeper dive, because what we really want to do is um, look at the activities and actions that we have taken or anticipated taking and really try to quantify where we are in um, achieving those things and being able to report back on those things because it's one thing to come up with recommendations and it's another thing to actually put them into play and that just kind of comes back to one of the things that we think is really important and that's the ongoing monitoring and so then that monitoring also can um kind of have some teeth and some real bearing in the conversation. So that's our update from EMAC. What time is that, James, that workshop? That workshop off the top of my head, I think it's like 11 to 2 p.m. So midday, thank you. Midday, yeah. Thank you, James. Commissioner Fai, you have an update uh, on STRAC. Uh, yes, quickly. Um... I do have a few updates and I think they're here, but I just wanted to say to tip my hat off to Commissioner Paul Savage because uh, I think uh, the conversation about the revenue sharing was something that you brought up early on. Um, so just wanted to recognize that this isn't new, that this is not something that we're having discussion today or because of the Nexus project. And I do support moving forward with, um, with these project discussions. With that, uh, the the statewide toll uh, rulemaking committee advisory committee, uh, we've been having really great meetings in terms of uh, discussing discussing the the draft rules for, and we've been sectioning out. So we've done part one, and the topics are listed on that slide as you see, and uh, we've been really having like three parts conversation with that rules, uh, draft rules. So enrollment, payment and enforcement and, and data privacy. Um, and we really focused last time around the float chart around enforcement um, and what that process looks like. And, and then, you know, chasing some existing rules that will have to change. Um, so that's been the focus. And then, uh, the, you know, the team, oh, that team's been really good at answering that committee's questions. Um, we are just as question, you know, we have just as many questions as this committee have, and a lot of uh, the same concerns that this committee is raising, but different. Um, we're really uh, focused on the rulemaking and what that looks like for a rate setting. And then the next part, and by the way, I do want to say, uh, perhaps the draft rules could be shared with the RTEC to see that if somebody have committee, uh, the, one of the members have of this committee have questions, maybe we can circulate that. And then you could send my question, your questions to me or to the staff, and then they can bubble up to the team um, for that. So I would recommend instead of later on having a reaction to the draft rules, perhaps be, let's be proactive and look at it because um, I know I've had a reaction when I first saw the, and and I'm not alone. Many of the members did. So please look at the draft um, rules as of now. We'll keep revising. They're not final. Um, and then the next topic we're going to uh, sort of have a robust conversation is the low income program operations process for rate setting and adjustments. What that looks like, the rules that will be in law, uh, and then discounts and exceptions, and then rates by vehicle. By type. So all that information, uh, I encourage everyone to really um, look into it. I think we need different uh, lens looking at it. I think we have a really uh, 
I, I think the committee is very diverse and, and brings to different voices, but I've heard the rate setting conversation come up at this table, but I haven't had any questions as well uh, sent to me or uh, to the team to bring it up. So I recommend all of you to get involved in that conversation and look at the rules so that you're not surprised later on. Thank you, Commissioner Fly. Mandy. Great, thank you. Um, I have just a couple updates on the regional ability pricing project and our next steps. And uh, we've heard encouragement to uh, rely on the staff that support many of you. And uh, that's what we're proposing to do with our next steps for the regional mobility pricing project. So uh, the team has worked on some concepts uh, for how to move forward with uh, regional pricing. Um, we'd like to discuss those with agency staff um, for input on the concepts as well as performance objectives before we begin modeling them. Um, and then uh, to have a conversation after the model results come in at a high level. Um, and at that point, we'd also have some preliminary information about rate ranges that likely would be needed to support the performance objectives that had been um, determined to be modeled. Um, so those meetings with the staff will take place in July. We're working on scheduling them now. Um, and we would see that there would be some high level modeling information um, by September um, based on our current schedule. So I know everyone's eager for that information and we are too. So we're looking forward to bringing that back um, in the near future. Thank you, Mandy. Well, we are nearing the end. Um, there, uh, this has been a robust conversation. A lot of ground has been covered and uh, just great stuff. Uh, I'd like to call on Director Strickler for any closing comments. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah before I close out, Commissioner, is, was your tent up? Could you have something else? Thank you, uh, Please, uh, Director Strickler. Um, I have been approached by a number of people, as I shared with Director Strickler earlier before the meeting started, uh, with regards to why is the price of gasoline going up so sharply uh, when in the rest of the country it's going down? And there's a nexus here to this conversation. And, you know, I'm aware that our carbon tax um, is a big part of that. And so I, when we talked about equity, um, I'm concerned that the safety and climate issues will not be achieved uh, without some means of transit. And when I see transit is not seen as a viable alternative to driving, and I hear about all this money that is being collected for getting the carbon tax on behalf of climate, is any of that money's tributal to transit and why are we having that discussion i mean we haven't we talked about funding all, all we really haven't talked about transit funding here today at all and i think that's a big part of achieving the goals but you know i'm probably going to send you know, all, all of you a written response as i think about the conundrum we've exposed here today um but i did i don't need an answer today but i think we need to ask ourselves um how we solve this transit funding issue sure. and put a transit system in place Thank you. Yes, I'll just say uh, not to answer it completely, but I would say I, I agree. We we have a transit funding issue as well as a non-auto funding issue and kind of across the board. I mean, we have limited funding uh, and a lot of need. And I think that that's the theme for government, frankly, but uh, we're seeing it more and more pronounced in the transportation space, um, especially to, in Oregon. Uh, it's not unique to us, but it's certainly uh, pervasive in all that we um, all that we have to do uh, from the transportation sector. Uh, so I don't I don't take that as just an ODOT uh, pressure. Uh, frankly, I take it as uh, all of the jurisdictions are under a very similar pressure, and we need to work together to figure out the path forward. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, and frankly, that's probably the best closeout uh, because, uh, quite honestly, um, that's really the theme for today. Uh, if I can implore us with anything is that we want to be part of the solution. We want to be a significant part of the solution. We want to do whatever we can uh, as an agency. Uh, and frankly, I'll admit I've got some of my own bias. I'm a bit of a nerd in the transportation space. Uh, and so for me, I'm, I'm jurisdictionally blind in a lot of ways, um, clearly not in every way. Uh, and that's where I need some help. Uh, but from the transportation sector perspective, we have a need. Uh, and that need spreads across the entire state. And uh, that need is going to be 
more than one mode. It's going to be uh, more than one option, and it's going to be focused uh, to uh, make the transportation system work better for Oregonians. I think in order to have that hard conversation, we've got to talk about all of these things. Uh, and so I welcome the conversation. I appreciate it uh, today. Uh, you will always hear me say that there's going to be tension as it relates to revenues and project needs, uh, but I think that's why we have this group. So I appreciate your input and thank you very much. Thank you. And Mayor Ann, I, I failed to recognize you earlier. Uh, we need blinking lights in this room or something. So, Put it on uh, right hand. And David, I would just like to apologize for not bringing the mimosa ingredients today. I should have <laughs> brought the sparkling Martinelli's um, to celebrate that 19 hours, 15 minutes ago, 66 individuals voted to support the funding for the I-5 bridge. And we are now moving on to the whole federal level. But that is something we should be celebrating. I was so surprised it wasn't on the front page of the Oregonian or the Columbian. So we'll work on that and we'll have sparkling Martinelli's next time. Marianne, thank you for bringing this, uh, reminding us of that significant accomplishment. And, and uh, yes, that is worthy of celebration. Well, if you think about it, this is really the first meeting of RTAC 2.0, the new and improved RTAC since the listening session from last month. And hopefully um, this is the way forward in terms of some presentations, but a lot of discussion and conversation. And hopefully uh, you are feeling heard. Uh, obviously that's gonna continue to be a theme um, and we'll continue to work on that. And so to that end, if you could please fill out the uh, meeting evaluation, we want to know what worked, what did not work in this meeting, how do we do better? Um, we will meet again on July 24th. That's coming up in four weeks. That'll be right here before we know it. And so between now and then, uh, have a enjoyable 4th of July weekend. That's this weekend. And um, until then, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you for being here. <laughs>